Dit is Daily Minutes Extra voor zaterdag 6 oktober 2018 met het al aangekondigde interview met David Friese, Whiskey One Hotel Kilo Juliet, de maker van FL Digi. Interview is in het Engels. QSO Today, episode 44. David Fries, W1 HKJ. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, your host. My QSO Today is with David Fries, W1 HKJ author of the FL series of software products, including FL Digi, winner of the 2014 ARRL Technical Excellence Award, longtime ham radio operator in Elmer. David's operating position has a number of computers in addition to radios. I'm quoting him from the Mac ham radio blog. Running all these computers is like an eight manual organ. 90% of the time is spent on software development, 10% on operating. We will deep dive with David into FL Digi and other software later in this podcast. W1 HKJ, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, David? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning, David. First, thanks for joining me on QSO today. Can we start at the very beginning of your ham radio story? Sure can. When and how did it be how how did you become interested in ha- amateur radio? Um my high school years were spent in New York City. And I had a friend whose dad was a ham radio operator. And I guess I was maybe 14 or 15 at the time. Mm-hmm. I visited his home, and his dad was in the basement surrounded by racks of World War II vintage radio equipment. And uh, he was operating CW at the time and carrying on a conversation with me and the CW conversation with the person on the other end of, of that QSO. And I just was flabbergasted to see someone able to do that. And it stuck in my mind for years. I I didn't become a radio operator right away, but it was uh, it was an experience that kind of piqued my interest in ham radio. So you're an early vision of multitasking. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember what year that was? That was about what time? Yes, that was probably 1953, 1954. Uh huh. And um, and when did you get your first license? Uh, I went to the Coast Guard Academy, which is in New London, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And I was there from 56 to 60 as a, as a cadet. And in 1957, I received my, my first call sign. Uh, and that was, let's see, I was 18 at the time. Mm-hmm. So it was a few years after that experience with my, my friend's dad. Mm-hmm. I actually learned CW first uh, for flashing light, and I could send and receive flashing light CW at about four words per minute. And that's, Is it, was this how they would teach CW, was with a flashing light rather than a sound? It was a requirement that you be able to uh, send and receive CW with flashing light because that was a, a mode of communications uh, during radio silence. Uh, oh, from ship to ship. Yes, yes. Ah, oh, oh, Okay. Well, how about that? Well, that would that does make sense. That would be CW. Uh, and at four words per minute doesn't sound very fast, but if you're uh, operating a um, a signal light, that's that's pretty fast. <laughs> and do you remember what your first call sign was? Yes, Kilo Two Lima Bravo Mike. And that was a uh, general class, or no? That was a uh, that I was actually KN two. I had a novice class uh-huh. first. And then I went to the general class later on. The uh, I've held several lights uh, call signs along the way. So you were a novice first. Yes. And uh, and you were in the Coast Guard Academy at the time that you got the novice. That's correct. Yeah. Did you have any Elmers or mentors uh, at the Coast Guard uh, who were hams? Yeah, we had a uh, a group of people there who were all members of the Amateur Radio Club, uh, and there were several. I can't pick out any one in particular, but there were a lot of people who. Uh, we're always willing to help you uh, get your code practice up. Uh, they administered the tests at the time because being in the military, the, the FCC allowed um, what, was not, what was now routine in terms of having uh, an amateur radio operator administer a test. That was done for the military back in those days. So I only sat for my, at an FCC exam when I went for my general class. Uh, in New York at the FCC field. Uh, no, that was something. <laughs> that was in actually Washington D.C. Ah, so I went to the, the home of the FCC. I went to the main office. 
when you were in the military and you had this new uh, novice license, was, was there a ham station there at the, the – um, Yes, there was. Coast Guard Academy? Yes, we had an amateur radio station and an interesting antenna system. The, the, the radio station was on the fourth floor of a, a barracks area. And the barracks building was built as a large U-shaped building. Mm-hmm. And we were up actually in the attic area. And we had a, a, a long line, long wire antenna that was inside the attic area. And we used to tune it up by using fluorescent bulbs to make sure it was tuned properly. <laughs> I, I remember as a kid that we used to – we actually used to tune our transmitter into a incandescent light bulb. Yes, uh, just to make sure that we could tune it up before we um, we put it, put it into the antenna. Oh yes, I can recall doing that. At this point, did, you didn't have a ham station of your own, or, or do you do you did you have a ham station at home? Uh, no, I did not. No, um, my first at home station was about mm-hmm. 1967 or thereabouts. Up until that mm-hmm. point, I'd always used the military ham, uh, ham stations, the club stations. Um, my first actual station was a B and W sixty one hundred with a Hammerlund receiver. Uh, the B and W sixty one hundred was a, was a single sideband phasing transceiver with more wow. controls on the front panel than you you would uh, ever want to see. <laughs> and do you remember which Hammerlund receiver you had? I can't recall. Uh, it's too far back. Uh huh. They were beautiful in those days. Yes, they were. Yeah, yeah. Big, very big. <laughs> They were, yeah, of course. Um, how did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education career after the military? Um, well, actually, I have 24 years active duty. I retired active wow. as an active duty member from the Coast Guard, uh-huh. plus an additional 13 years as a civil service uh, member in the Coast Guard. So I've got about 37 years with the Coast Guard, and it's all been primarily in the realm of electronics and software development. Uh-huh. Uh, I was very instrumental in a lot of the hardware development for the Loran C system. It's no longer an active navigation system, but it was at one time. Um, and just before I retired in 2000, I was the lead for all of the Coast Guard software development. I would imagine that during your tenure at the Coast Guard that the duties of the Coast Guard expanded as a result of the war on drugs. Yes, that's true. Yeah, uh-huh. it, for interdiction of drugs that are trying to be smuggled into the country um, by sea. Uh huh. And so, and there's quite a bit of that. A lot in the Caribbean and even on the West Coast, uh, drug drug people are bringing up drugs. Um, even in, believe it or not, in uh, homemade submarines. So tell me, as a as a career military man in the Coast Guard. Did you always live in military housing, and uh, therefore were you able to operate? No, uh, the the Coast Guard uh, doesn't maintain a whole lot of uh, military housing, so you're mm-hmm. usually on your own. But I, I went to the Naval Post Graduate School in Monterey, California, and of course I lived in Navy housing at that time. Um, I did have uh, a, a, both an amateur radio operating station at home, and I also used the one at the school. I was stationed in Alaska at a remote isolated duty station during the 1964-65, mm-hmm. and that was the time when we had the very big earthquake in Alaska. And I did have uh, an amateur radio station with me at the time there. An interesting antenna. It was the only time I was able to build a rhombic, and that was a very large rhombic, 600 foot on, a, on each leg. And it was a terminated rhombic aimed to the east coast of the United States. Mm-hmm. And where were you in uh, in Alaska? Uh, stationed in a, in a place called Yakutat, and that's uh, in the Tongass National Forest, about halfway between Anchorage and Juneau. Um, it's a community of about 500 Clinkett Indians. So there was plenty of real estate for a rhombic antenna. Oh, more than enough. <laughs> Uh-huh. And lots of lots of and trees to hang it from. Perform? I'm sorry. And how did that antenna perform to the East Coast? I was going to tell you how well it performed. Um, at the time of the earthquake, uh, Yakutat was declared to have been obliterated from the Earth. At least that's what many of the broadcast stations had had announced. 
And of course, my wife was not with me. She was at, back in, in the New York area with our two children at the time. And she was wondering whatever, what would happen to me up there. And I was able to get on the radio, on a ham radio, and make one call to, for, for a contact to the East Coast. And I, and, and I called for the New York City area. And within that one call, I had about a dozen stations willing to help me. And so I had a, uh, a nice phone patch. Mm-hmm. which allowed me to ensure her that I was still alive and she was not ready to cash in the insurance money. <laughs> <laughs> so so obviously it, it sounds to me like perhaps um, your military career actually had more of an impact on your family life than amateur radio did. But what kind of impact did uh, amateur radio have on your family life? Well, that was a positive impact, certainly because my wife was able to be reassured that I was still around. Mm-hmm. But um, it's had a negative impact in a lot of ways, mostly because um, I'm so intense about what I do. And uh, my wife likes to say that she's a ham radio widow. And uh, so I have to be careful I don't allow my interests in ham radio to overwhelm my domestic duties. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> but I think that's probably true of a lot of amateur radio operators. Yeah, my, my wife decided she wanted to pursue a Ph.D. about four years ago, and I said, oh, what a great idea, because if she's pursuing her Ph.D., I'm doing amateur radio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's about to end. I have to find her some other avocation. Okay. <laughs> you have two children. I have, um, no, actually, children? I have, I have three boys, ah, three sons, okay. and they're all age 50 and over at this point. And any of them ham radio operators? None, but they were all in the electronics industry. So what what kind of rig do you operate now? I have a Yaesu uh, FT950 that I use most of the time. I also have a Tentac Pegasus and a Kachina 505 DSP. Uh, the Kachinas were actually very, very nice transceivers, but um, probably overpriced for and weren't very successful at the during the period of time that they sold them. Okay, and it's my understanding, because um, you, you make a note someplace, that um, you run a 2-meter copper magnetic loop antenna on 40, 30, and 20. I, I have a – that's right. I have a 2-meter copper loop antenna that I built. I use it mostly on 30, um, primarily because I, I failed to complete my control unit for the uh, variable – vacuum variable. <laughs> and so I, I leave it set on 30 meters. It works great. Uh huh. And and what is it exactly? Uh, and w- when you say two meters in diameter, that's a pretty that's a pretty large loop antenna. Yes. What's the diameter of the tube that you're using? Oh, I'm using three quarter inch copper tubing, and it, I'm I'm sitting right here looking at it out my window. It's only about um, five meters away from me, mm-hmm. and um, it's all all kind of brazed construction, and it wow. ha- with a uh, very small copper ground wire piece of copper ground wire used for the uh, driving element. It, Amazing. And how, how does that antenna perform compared to your wire antennas? Because I understand you've got, you know, you also have some uh, fan dipoles. And right. Fan dipoles. Well. And I also have a vertical that can tune to 30. Um, it performs equally well. I've used it um, in comparison by looking at um, some of the reports from some of the robot receiving stations. Mm-hmm. And it's about equal. And it's it's a quiet antenna compared to say the vertical. Yes. Oh, very very quiet. Yes. What's interesting is I have the antenna so that the null of the of the antenna is aimed at my ham shack, uh-huh. and I can go in the air with 100 watts and never get any RFI in the shack. And the antenna is just within almost within arm's reach uh, of your ham shack. Yes. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's well that that's one of my projects this summer is to build a a 20 meter uh, receiving loop. Um, because of the electronic noise we have here. Yes. Oh, well, it'll reduce it quite a bit. So what's your favorite operating mode? Well, for years it was CW. Uh, mm-hmm. I couldn't even find a microphone unless I was absolutely forced to do so. Um, but I lost my hearing about the time I retired in 2000. And so CW became more and more difficult. And a friend of mine suggested that I should think about digital modes. And he suggested I look at a program called GMFSK. I don't know if you're familiar with that one or not, but GMFSK was written by a fellow named 
Tommy Maninen, OH2 BNS. And I think Tony was had um I think he was going to school and it was becoming too difficult for him to maintain it. So by just by de facto, I became the maintainer of the program, made some changes. Um, I didn't intend to publish it, but somehow it leaked out that I had made changes to GMFSK. And so for about three years, I was the maintainer for that program. At that point, I decided um, I might want to try to do this on my own and, Tommy's code was excellent. I could take most of it, and using it as a basis, I could write a C++ application, which turned out eventually to be FL Digi. But um, since that time, uh, I'm, I operate almost entirely digital mode. My favorite two modes are PSK31 and MFSK16. But I think that's simply because they're, easy, they're the easiest ones to make a QSO with. Uh-huh. There's so many people out there using them. There are better modes than either one of the two. Mm-hmm. But they're the mo- they seem to be the most popular. Yes, they are the most popular. Well, you know, you're best known for FL Digi, and um, and you now have a, a very respectable list of free software products with the FL designation in front. Can you uh, talk a little bit about FL Digi and and what it is and um, why someone would use FL Digi if they're pursuing the digital modes? Well, the first thing is it's um, it's public domain software. Uh, because it was based in part on some of the work that Tommy did, uh, it continued to be a general public license software, which means that all of the code is available to you. So if you have any skills at all in the C++ language, or if you'd like to become skilled in it, it the code itself is is like a textbook on how to design uh, digital signal processing elements for both encoding and decoding uh, digital transmissions. There's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of, of uh, comments in there which allows you to really understand what's happening internally. It, FL Digi is a, a general purpose digital signal processing modem program that allows you to send and receive on about I think the current count is around 40 different digital modes, if you include all of the sub-modes. Uh, it includes the ability to send images using uh, MFSK in a picture mode. Um, really, it, the digital modes are a fantastic way to communicate because you can have nearly 100% QSO uh, a signal-to-noise ratio that is much below what you could ever expect to even do with CW. Plus, you have all of the uh, you have all of the ASCII characters. Yes, uh, actually, mm-hmm. FLDG uses a UTF-8 character set, mm-hmm. so it, it's beyond the ASCII character set. Um, you can send and receive in Cyrillic, uh, which would include Greek, Russian, Ukrainian. Uh, probably Czechoslovakian uh, as, a, mm-hmm. as an example. Uh, you could send and receive using the, U- the Hebrew character set if, mm-hmm. it were, if it's available in the UTF-8 format. Mm-hmm. Um, Voice of America uses FL Digi for all of its digital broadcast over its AM uh, broadcast radios. And they routinely send uh, out broadcasts in Chinese or other uh, Asian languages that are use the UTF-8 character set. So it's it's pretty 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 widely used by a number of different places outside of amateur radio even. Well, that's amazing. So Voice of America has identified a user base of of listeners that actually could use uh, FL Digi or you know to actually receive or something like that. Yes, that's cr- that's true. Um, wow, and there's an I have one of my FL Digi was originally my own creation, but over the years it's grown much beyond what I can do. I have a team of about 20 different developers who are at various times are either active or or idle, but they're all there. Uh, It's a worldwide consortium, including Mm -hmm. people in Australia, uh, South Africa, New Zealand, um, Israel. Um, there's a gentleman in Australia who has taken all of the FL Digi code and ported it over to a, an Android application. 
He calls it AND FL message. It's a combination of FL Digi and the FL message uh, generator that I wrote. And it can be used to receive uh, any of the digital broadcasts, including the ones made by VOA. Um, the Voice of America, after they've made their publish, they use, he, the fellow named Kim Elliott uh, usually sends me some feedback as to various reception reports. And mm-hmm. some of those were by people uh, receiving the FL Digi digital, digital broadcast using a, um, a tablet, an Android tablet, or even a, an Android phone. So they're actually receiving an off-the-air signal, or the Voice of America is, um, is kind of pumping FL Digi into the Internet somehow? I mean, No, it's off-the-air, on, on the air. Uh-huh. Um, th- th- and in fact, if you visit VOA uh, online site, you can probably look up what their schedule is for the broadcast. Um, it's every Saturday and Sunday. Uh-huh. And there's several broadcasts on de- different frequencies from different transmitting stations around the world, some in the U.S., some in oh, um, Asia, and some in Europe. You probably get the one from Germany very well. Oh, so I understand what's going on. So they've got the speaker turned up on the radio, and they, they're using the microphone on the Android device. That's correct. Device. That's, a, ah, oh, that's how they're to- doing it. Um, oh, okay. A- and the broadcast from, from VOA is on AM radio. And so you can either listen to it, you know, the AM broadcast, or you could look at upper or lower sideband to look at one of the two. Um, but it's, it's really quite effective. They, they, he's tried testing it with um, uh, the FL Digi broadcast in the background with music still continuing in the foreground. And that works, but it, the music sometimes provides um, the equivalent of noise background. So most of the time his broadcasts are – only in the FL Digi digital mode, and it's just applied to the AM signal. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, um, it's really cool. And he, he, yeah, it's very cool. He always sends um, MFSK as well as other modes. He, the primary mode he uses is MFSK, and so he'll always send uh, a sequence of digital photos. Images along with various elements of the broadcast. Well, now you've, now you've piqued my interest in um, just to see what the Voice of America is doing. Yeah, you'll have to download FL Digi so you can receive it. Uh, ab- absolutely. Well, you know what? When I was looking at the FL Digi site, it appeared to me that, that there's a lot of other features in FL Digi that have been added. Well, can you explain you know, what other things that FL Digi does? Digi does besides encoding and decoding the um, the various digital modes. Sure. Um, if you look at the at my website, you'll see that um, there's a number of the FL applications. By the way, FL stands for fast light because all of the the, u- the user interface uh, GUI code that I use to support the programs is the uh-huh. fast light toolkit FLTK. So I just kept the FL. It just <laughs> everyone wants to know what FL means. <laughs> well, it actually was one of my questions here on my list. Yeah, it's 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 borrowed from FLTK, which is the toolkit used for the for the user interface. Um, okay. But my one of my interests, and I guess generated by my experience in Alaska so many years ago, fifty almost now at this point, um, mm-hmm. is in emergency communications. And so much of what FL Digi has been designed to do over the last several years is to be a platform for the base platform for emergency communications. And in fact, if you look on there, you'll see something called, um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting up. My, my brain is getting cramped. <laughs> well, anyway, okay. there, there's a sequence of programs in there that are all designed specifically for the EMCOM usage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that includes FLARQ, which is an, an amateur radio receive request uh, type of thing. So it's, mm-hmm. think of the, the old days we used to um, do uh, packet and – Right, you know, Pack- digipeating. Yeah, digipeating. FLARQ provides that kind of facility. It means that you can pass data back and forth um, in a way that you have a checksum associated with all of data. 
And so you know for sure that whether or not it's been received correctly or not. If not, it's you re, you do a repeat request. Um, there's a there's a something called FLAMP, which is amateur multicast protocol, and that's a way of doing broadcasts over a repeated broadcasts so that the receiver can can receive the same broadcast multiple times, mm-hmm. and when the broadcast has been received in its entirety. And checksum, so it's not, that the, the rece- reception has been a hundred percent. Then that individual will know that it's received that. So that's being used in multiple ways in the emergency communications arena. There's something called FL Message, which is a forms manager with a, many, many different forms that are already that are canned and, and ready to go, or um, any kind of an HTML form can be used as the basis for a form within that program. But all of these things that I've just mentioned so far are specifically um, designed to be used by the emergency communications people, RACES, ARIES, and those type of people. And they're all interfaced directly or indirectly to FL Digi. So, for example, FL AMP uh, send is, is, communicates via a socket interface with FL Digi so it can control whether FL Digi is transmitting or receiving, etc. Uh, the same thing with FL Message. If if you if you were on a an emergency communications frequency and FL Digi decoded a an FL Message formatted a transmission, it would automatically open up FL Message and display the message that came in. So there's a lot of um, ancillary things going on that um, pe- a lot of people don't use, but it was there because of my interest in in the emergency communications field. And I'm not a RACES member. I'm not an ARIES member. So mm-hmm. I, I have, I, I only do, I create these things for other people to use. Mm-hmm. Well, well, you got my, my brain is sitting here, um, you know, spinning at a hundred miles an hour in terms of, uh, what you could do with this. So, so this means if I wanted to set up, you know, with my friends here, a an emergency uh, message network. Yes. You know that that works the whole country. Uh, now our country is the size of New Jersey, but um, <laughs> it's not like the United States. But you could use um, like forty meters, for example, as a message handling network. Yes. And you could actually, you know, spit the message into the system, and it could find its way from one end to the other, even if it has to be repeated some intermediate points along the way. That's correct. Uh, FL AMP, for example, has the ability to uh, operate in a repeat mode so that mm-hmm. uh, station A can uh, initiate the initial, initial broadcast and uh, station B or C down the line could rebroadcast it. And the final recipient could be receiving the information from, all, from A, B, and C and, wow. and reassembling the entire message. Do you know if there's any um, message networks in place across the world that are already doing this? Uh, yes, there are. Most of them are in the U.S. Uh-huh. And there's a there's probably a twenty or so different uh, EM com groups that are using all of this software uh, sp- during real em- real uh, emergency emergencies and also during uh, much of their drills. Mm-hmm. Um, the the northeast part of our country, uh, in the particularly Massachusetts, got hit very hard this last um, winter season by very heavy snowfalls mm-hmm, and, right. and other other storms. And the uh, Cape Cod uh, Aries group used FL Digi and all of, of the other programs specifically for all of its uh, emergency communications. Um, and if, and they were doing it on on UHF VHF. Uh, which and it works equally well there, uh, either on sideband or FM. They they were using uh, FM on VHF, and there are some modes available for the UHF VHF operator that are extremely high speed, up to about six thousand words per minute, and so uh, it's almost like instant instant message servicing, uh, but uh-huh. but over amateur radio. And and so they were using the FL message with FL Digi and some of its very high speed PSK modes. Yeah, this comes up frequently in QSO today conversations. 
and, and that is is, is that uh, you know the the internet infrastructure that we rely on so heavily is actually quite fragile. And um, I, I mean, I can think of a, a time just a few years ago when a, when a um, a ship threw its anchor in the water outside of Alexandria, e- Egypt, and snagged a submarine cable and took out most of the Middle East from the, from the internet. You know, as a result of that, yeah, my mind is spinning here in terms of um, ways that it would be possible to, you know, continue sending messages, uh, you know, uh, even through across gateways from um, uh, as third party traffic. Yes. You know, um, from one end of the world to the other, just to let people know the things like I would imagine, for example, something like this um, in Nepal right now would be quite handy and useful. Yes, indeed. I think so. Um all of the messages that are handled by by all of this software are mm-hmm. are pure text messages. There's, there's no there's no binary data involved in it. So, um, the the file associated with the, tr- the data transfer could be picked up and transferred if it's available via a uh, an internet connection. But if mm-hmm. but when, when that's not available, then also this data can be sent via amateur radio. Um, I, most of the times when they've when the drills have been run with other emergency communications people that might be like EMTs or hospitals, mm-hmm. they've really been surprised at how effective um, the, this communication mode of communication can be and how well it transfers the data. Um, and there are some things that you know are very difficult to transfer if you are simply using voice radio. If you were trying to transfer a list of of um, drugs, for example, if you needed to have emergency uh, drug um, list of drugs to be sent to somebody, that'd be a very mm-hmm. difficult list to, to transfer uh, using voice. But it absolutely a hundred percent transferred without any errors using all of these digital modes. Can you use FL Digi with the, any of the satellite modes? I mean, can you store up your messages for? Um uh, interception by a, a, a satellite that might pass overhead. I don't know of anyone doing it right now, but there's no reason it couldn't be it, because it's simply an audio signal, mm-hmm. and it's like passing any other audio signal. Uh, that's just another medium. Well, what's on the drawing board for FL software products? Are there, do you have any ideas brewing right now in terms of what what else you could do with it that you're not doing now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, there is. So I'm always, Can you share? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm always doing something. <laughs> um, I don't know if you uh, recognize these two uh, gentlemen, but there's a fellow named Murray Greenman, uh, ZL1BPU, and Khan Wasilev, ZL2AFP. Uh, they live in New Zealand, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, Murray has, is the inventor of several different digital modes, inc- including MFSK uh, and Domino EX. The, if you're not into digital modes, they may not be very no, I've heard. I've heard of these, actually. Actually, he's, he's the man that invented them. Mm-hmm. Um, I invented one called Thor, which is very similar to um, Domino EX. But... Um, Murray has recently invented a, call, a, a mode called FSQ, and it stands for SAP Fast Simple QSO, and it's um, a little bit different than most digital modes that people are used to because it's, as opposed to character-based, it's line-based. You, you type in a line of text, hit the return, and that line of text goes out, and you wait and return for another line of text coming back. A little bit slower, perhaps, than some of our modes now, but the the actual modem code is such that it can go to about minus 15 dB signal-to-noise ratio in terms of being able to be decoded successfully. Uh, so that, that's pretty far down the noise. Right. So you're not even – with your ears, you're not even hearing. Yeah, you know, all you're hearing is noise. No, that's right. right. Yeah. You, you might be able – most digital mode, modem programs use a waterfall to uh, basically display – um, a a frequency display in time mm-hmm. with the intensity of the signal being indicated by both color and color intensity. You might you might see some of those digital signals in there, but they would be mixed in among all the noise. But anyway, uh, he has a program called FSQ C A L L FSQ Call, which was written 
by Khan, but it's only available in Windows. And I hate to admit it, but I, um, I'm kind of a Linux geek. I've, I've, uh-huh. I've done Unix all my life, uh, only Windows on the, only under duress. Uh, and so I was asked if I would um, include FSQ in, as a modem under FLDigi, and I've been working on that, and it's about the 95% point. And in fact, um, all of all of FS, FL Digi is available in multiple operating systems. It's it's built on a Linux platform, and but I write a uh, cross compile it so it's available under Windows, and it's also available on OS X. So it's available on all the major OS platforms. And so well, I, I wrote that I wrote that you admitted that you actually own a. Windows computer. <laughs> uh, I have a Windows 8.1, a Windows XP, a Windows version 7. I need them because I have to test this stuff. <laughs> uh-huh. In fact, so you don't you don't job that off to someone else. No, we're on an 8.1 right now, so I'm talking to you on Windows. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I'm I'm rather uh, OS gnostic. That doesn't make any difference what I, what I use, but I prefer Linux. But at any rate, uh, the ob- objective was to be able to add this new modem type called FSQ to FL Digi because it has uh, a lot of potential in the EMCOM community. It's, it really provi- can provide them with some additional tools to use. So that's probably going to be out in either the next version or the one after that. It's getting pretty close to being released. How long does it take um, for one of these new digital modes to propagate across the ham radio communica- community before you've got someone to talk to? Oh. I mean, does it take long? No, it doesn't. Um, as soon as you're out there and somebody recognizes a mode they haven't seen before, they're on the Internet looking to see what, what that was. <laughs> and so, ah. uh, so it doesn't take very long. Um, and the Internet, you know, it, I love – it's fragile, but it's it's super. I couldn't do any of this work if I didn't have the internet resources available to me. I have you know this group of twenty developers over the whole world, and we communicate almost all the time using the internet, and and that's how we share our work. Well, I wasn't complaining about uh, in the internet. The internet makes it possible for me to sit here and talk to you the way I'm. You know, Absolutely. talking to you now and right. to be able to put out the QSO Today podcast. I guess my only concern is is, is that um, you know when there's a real natural disaster, you know it, you can't rely on it. Um, at least you know maybe not locally if the local interest infrastructure is um, has been buried or washed away or blown away. I live in Tornado Alley. In fact, the area I live in is is just north of Huntsville, Alabama. Uh-huh. And um, I've had tornadoes come within two and a half miles of the house. And so I'm very aware of what um, natural disasters can do to a, to the infrastructure. This is why you have wire antennas instead of that 60-foot tower that's, with the monster beam on the roof. Uh, actually, I would have the tower, but it, um, you know, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, and my wife would not think that a beautiful object. <laughs> <laughs> It, it's funny how different we are. <laughs> I know. <laughs> she, she, I, I keep telling my wife I want to. I want to put a hex beam on the roof, and she said um, the, the the neighbors will, you know, burn you at the stake. <laughs> so well, they might do the same if you if you build your um, loop antenna. <laughs> you know, I put the loop antenna out on the back out on the back, and people will think it's a like a dream catcher or something like that. that, That'll be good. Uh, um, You're aware of, you know all about dream catchers. Well, I don't, but um, I know what they kind of look like. And um, and I probably could sell that to most of the neighbors. It's an American Indian thing, actually. Yeah. So with FL Digi then, if if there's a new mode and you've got this new mode, you know, in the latest version of FL Digi, if I'm tuning around the band and I'm not, for example, uh, I haven't tried FSQ call. Will um, FLDG automatically switch into that mode and, and when, it, when it crosses the band and start decoding it and tell you what it is that you're looking at? Or do you actually have to manually go through and um, try each mode to see if you can decode what's there? That's a very good question, Eric. Um, there's a, a fellow named Patrick who's the developer of a um, another, di- another digital mode program who created something uh, called RSID 
which is a Reed Solomon identification sequence. And uh, RSID is a special transmission that can that precedes any di- can precede any digital trans- transmission. And when decoded, will will automatically take your your program and either tell you what the new mode is that, uh, or, and or change to it automatically and start decoding it. Uh, FL Digi uses RSID identifiers for almost 100% of its digital modems. It doesn't do it for some, and some of them you really don't need it. You don't want it for CW, for example. Um, and most people, if they've been around long enough, can tune to a, a, a radio teletype signal and recognize uh, an RTT Y signal just from the sound. Mm-hmm. Um, but many of the more esoteric modes, you wouldn't know what it was you were listening to unless you had spent many, many hours listening to them. So the RSID is an identifier code that's, that's, that's sent. It's separate from, it's a separate type of a code from all the rest of them. And it allows your, your program to automatically identify the mode, change to it if you've configured it for that to do so. And so when I publish FSQ for FL Digi, it will have a, associated with it a, an identifier mode, an RSID code. Is that a convention that, that you've created, or is there like some uh, nas- international agreement on what these RSID codes should be um, for each of these modes? It's, a, it's an agreement between those of us who are in the development community for digital modem programs. Uh-huh. Um, the fellow who invented the, F, uh, the uh, RSID code is Patrick, and he created uh, multi-PSK which is mm. a p- program principally for Windows users. And he, he is rather possessive of the, of the codes, and, but, mm-hmm. he, but he gives out, he'll give out a block of codes to various developers, and he's done that for FL Digi. So for code sequence, modem codes, which are unique to FL Digi, I have a set of a block that I can draw upon uh, for this RSID assignment. But now, I got the impression from looking at your site with the FL Digi site that, that you also have some rig control. Yes. Uh, Can you t- talk about that a little bit? Yeah, FL Rig is um, a, a transceiver control program that that uh, has all of the back end code in it for about fifty different transceivers. Um, probably a vintage nineteen eighty plus to, to current. Um, mm-hmm. Supports many many different. Uh, transceiver manufacturers, and it's a common interface and a common user interface so that for every transceiver, the interface that you see on the computer screen, it's identical. That means that you know, some transceivers don't have every little bell and whistle that it's been key- uh, keyed for, but it, for every requirement for the digital mode operation, uh, those transceivers are supported. And so, for example, you can con- uh, via FL Digi uh, communicating to FL Rig, communicating to the transceiver, you can either query or control things like frequency, uh, mode of operation at the transceiver, bandwidth at the transceiver, um, notch filtering at the transceiver, uh, various other aspects of transceiver operation. Um, so uh, when I'm using FL Digi with my F, my Yesu FT950, I never touch the transceiver except to turn it on or off. Oh, interesting. So if I wanted to operate Whisper, we had um, Carol Malazzo, KP4MD, on who was uh, who was doing some experiments with um, with uh, Whisper in VHF and UHF. Mm-hmm. If I wanted to use the whisper mode when I'm working on some other, I'm working on some other transceiver, or I'm doing something else in my ham shack, and I wanted to kind of go through the different bands and beacon and receive, could you do that with FL Digi with an FL rig? No, um, FL Digi does not support uh, the whisper mode. Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, it's not within uh, my, primarily because it it doesn't fall into the EMCOM purview. Okay, but you could conceivably do something similar in one of the other digital modes. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, even even um, program it for different times. It, the way it's set up, there's um, there are there's a 
complete macro, what's called a macro language that's available to a uh, FL Digi user. And so he can, he can set up for FL Digi to automatically change the transceiver at specific times mm-hmm. so that it could move to a different frequency or different mode, different band. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, David, what, oh, go ahead. That's why there's about 500,000 lines of code. <laughs> So it's, it keeps you busy in your retirement. Oh yes, yeah. David, what's what is the biggest challenge to ham radio to you? I think the the integration of um, our our HF and VHF communications with the internet services, so that um, we can have transparency, especially for the emergency communications people. Uh, that that transparency isn't quite here yet. It takes a it takes a bit of, of um, handling on a part of individuals to, to get that message transport between the various media. I see. So what you're talking about perhaps is um, that barrier where the, the licensed ham radio operator is actually the mediator between the, the third-party traffic and the, the um, amateur radio service itself. Right. You know, some of that, of course, is limited by uh, regulations and laws within the various countries that we operate, either within or, or between. And so we have to be aware of those also. But I think we need to have a little bit more transparency between them so that um, if I'm sending a message from point A to point B, it shouldn't make any difference you know, how it, what, what, what the mode of, of transmission is. Hmm. Unless that that transmission is an advertisement, well, a, then know, then you'd have a problem because that would be um, uh, prohibited prohibited yeah. under most laws. Well, what what advice would you give to a newer returning ham to amateur radio with all your years <laughs> experience? <laughs> Read the manual. <laughs> 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 well, you, you know better than that, David. We, as ham radio operators, we never read the manual. I just bought a new automobile, and before I drove it, I read the manual. <laughs> but I, I'm probably unique. Uh, no, most people just figure they can fly by the seat of the pants. Um, I guess the best advice I can give people it would be, if they, especially if they're into the digital modes, uh-huh. is to seek out help on the Internet. And there are... Uh, there are for FL Digi, for example, and then for others, um, FL Digi has three different uh, Yahoo groups with uh, approximately eight thousand members uh, between the three of them. Um, depending upon whether you're a Windows operator or, or a Linux operator or an OS X operator, or if you're interested primarily in emergency communications, you would now you would probably. Uh, Move to one of those three different groups. Uh, I could let you have the names of them, but they're all acronyms. So, but you can look them up on the, on. No, uh, what I'll do is I'll look them all up and I'll put them in the show notes page. That's good. But the, there's always they're all Elmers on there. They're all willing to help you, and so uh-huh. there's all kinds of help available to a new, especially a a, a, a novice operator within the digital modes. This is a whole universe that I'm not familiar with. Yeah, this is really cool. Uh, I, I've, I've been, I'm, I'm grateful that you came on to QSO today, David. And from looking at FL Digi and hearing what you're saying, um, I guess I have to expand my list of to-dos this year, and, and that, that's to include um, starting to operate some of the digital modes just to see how they work out for me. Oh, I think you'll love it. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. I want to thank you so much for uh, joining me on QSO today. Again, thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome. 73. It's been my pleasure. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed my QSO Today with David W1HKJ. Be sure to check out the show notes page at www.qsotoday.com and put in W1HKJ in the search bar at the top of the page. I will post links to the references that David made in the podcast. If you have any questions for David, please be sure to put them in the comments section at the bottom of the W1HKJ show notes page. QSO Today is available in the iTunes Store and in the Stitcher podcast app for both iPhone and Android. There are links to these places on the QSO Today website. 
I'm always on the lookout for interesting guests for the podcast. Your suggestions are very important to finding QSO Today guests. Please send me your suggestions on the comments page at www.qsotoday.com at the website. Please take the time to join the QSO Today community. There are buttons on the website and on the show notes page for this. I promise not to spam you or share your email address with anyone. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG73.